presentation today isn't based on a specific research project um, or dedicated work that we've done. Rather, the concept of the 20 minute neighbourhood is and other similar initiatives is something that uh, has cropped up in different forms in our work, looking at the urban dimension of regional policy, notably looking at EU funded sustainable urban development strategies. Um, sustainable urban mobility is a key priority in many of them, and we've we've seen evolving initiatives that reflect some characteristics from the 20 minute neighbourhood idea. Um, and these same characteristics have become prominent uh, in uh, discussions of regional and urban policy responses to the COVID uh, pandemic. So my aim here is to raise some issues for discussion, things that should be considered when thinking about the evolution and application uh, of this concept. Um, I'll divide my presentation into, into these four sections. So looking first um, at the overall context, how the 20 minute a neighbourhood idea fits into current regional uh, policy thinking, particularly in terms of the urban dimension. I'll then look at some uh, some of the concepts, principles, organising characteristics. I'll flesh it out a little bit more by looking at briefly at some examples in practice, and then I'll finish by raising some issues to be considered when looking forward, inevitably including um, in the COVID-19 context. So first, um, in terms of the, the regional policy context, I think it's, it's, it's become clear that this idea, the, the 20 minute neighbourhood um, and related ideas, um, pick up a number of strands in the current regional, uh, current regional policy thinking, particularly in terms of how the urban dimension um, is addressed. First, there's the rise to prominence of the place-based initiatives in the regional policy debate. As with uh, many fashionable terms, this can mean different things to different people. Um, but generally, I think we can say that a quite, it takes quite a fine grained territorial focus, looking within um, regional and local administrative boundaries to identify the specific potentials and challenges um, of local communities and trying to design tailored initiatives um, to address these. So this includes different urban spaces and, and their communities. Second, of course, there's the regional policy push to support um, green and climate friendly objectives. This again includes an urban dimension, responding to the sense of over concentration of the population in certain urban areas, how this leads to undesirable uh, side effects, uh, congestion, pollution, urban sprawl. So cities are home to many communities, both spatial and social and infrastructure that are vulnerable to the effects of global warning, uh, warming. Third, there's also the importance of well-being um, and resilience on, in the, on current regional policy agendas. Comparable indicators of quality of life and well-being are increasingly used um, to look beyond the functioning of regional and local economies. So looking at a range of living conditions, physical health, welfare, risk of poverty, access to housing, services and so on. The challenge of achieving sustainable urban mobility picks up on these issues. So the traditional approach of increasing mobility by providing more road space is not seen anymore as economically productive, environmentally sustainable or particularly equitable. Urban areas experience traffic congestion, air pollution, high cost of transport, poor quality of life. So the cost of travel can increase considerably, especially for the less affluent. Access to services or public space can be limited for some citizens. Lower rents, land prices and extended city peripheries can increase travel distances, so limiting non-motorised forms of transport and so on. In response, regions and cities have started to introduce measures to support uh, urban mobility systems that are less de detrimental to the health and well-being of people and work to benefit local economies and environments. So this Overall, it's where connections are made with the 20 minute neighbourhood concept. OK, so the 20 minute neighbourhood, similar initiatives, picks up and connects these prominent issues in, in regional policy at the moment. 
This is based on research into how city inhabitants' use of time can be reorganised to improve both living conditions um, and the environment. I've started this section with a, a quote from Professor Carlos Moreno, who's seen as one of the, the fathers, one of the leading figures um, of this concept, a uh, scientific director at the Sorbonne and an advisor to the mayor of Paris. As you can see from the quote, his key objective is to break down different types of social, economic and architectural segmentation in urban areas. Basically, daily necessities should be within 15 or 20 minutes reach on foot or by bike. So work, home, shops, entertainment, education, healthcare and so on should be available within the same time it may take a commuter to wait uh, for a train on a railway platform. In terms of the basic principles, I think we can identify these points. Residents of every neighbourhood should have access to goods and services. Every neighbourhood should have a variety of housing types, different sizes, levels of affordability. Residents should have access to, to clean air and access to green spaces in their neighbourhood. People should be able to work close to home or remotely, thanks to the presence of smaller scale offices, retail and hospitality, co-working spaces or, or hubs. Within this, the concept is quite flexible. Indeed, it goes under different names and different contexts. So we have the 20 minute neighbourhood, the 50 minute city and so on. I'll refer in a moment to some examples from European countries, but there are variations of this concept that have gained traction across the world, Asia, South America and elsewhere. But some core components um, can, can be identified and they're included in this slide. First, it means strength, strengthened walking and cycling, cycling infrastructure. So giving more space to pedestrians and cyclists, making it safe, accessible and connected. Also means giving access to quality public transport that connects people to jobs and higher order services. It also involves creating complex neighbourhoods, so decentralising core services, developing a social and functional mix in these neighbourhoods, um, include, including mixed housing provision. Also, it also includes the, the flexible use of buildings in public space for multiple functions. And there's a focus on high quality public areas um, and open spaces. There's also emphasis on strengthening teleworking and service digitalization. So the provision of Wi-Fi and high-speed internet in part to, to support neighborhood co-working spaces um, and, and hubs. In terms of planning, Responding to this agenda has been associated with an increased focus on accessibility rather than mobility. So put simply, mobility looks at speed of travel. It's about how far you can go in a given amount of time. Accessibility, on the other hand, is how much you can get to in that time. So this means considering how many and what types of destinations can be reached within a time budget from a given neighbourhood. And then looking through scenarios for different modes of transport, um, different networks in terms of fit within this 20 minute or 15 minute rule. So prior, prior, priority within this is given to walkability and sustainability. I think this obviously implies a proactive rather than a reactive um, approach to spatial planning and regulation. So deciding ex ante where and where not development should take place. But these analyses ultimately inform policy decisions. Accessibility measures offer a clearer sense of what people value in cities, but the acceptable parameters of what's considered to be accessible must be set uh, through policy. So developing consensus in this is obviously a challenge. There's a need to bring together different policy fields, transport, housing, economic development, social welfare, and so on. It's also important to bring together economic development strategies and spatial planning frameworks, something we know from our research isn't, isn't always well coordinated. It's also important to seek uh, participatory input from people and firms in neighbourhoods and across the city to map out the presence and absence at the neighbourhood level of these amenities, businesses, job types, uh, public spaces and so on. There's also an increasing emphasis on participatory budgeting or other methods to, to boost this participation um, to give inhabitants a direct say on how investment is carried out in their neighbourhoods. 
The overall aim is to get active engagement from local inhabitants to inform the, the design of investments and commitment. I think it's also worth noting that a common component in these uh, initiatives, uh, 20 and so on, is, is strong local leadership. The launch of, of these initiatives is all, often associated with active involvement and leadership from mayors and other local actors, championing change and driving this agenda forward. Okay, I'll turn now quickly to some, some examples of the concept in practice. First, we will take the case of Barcelona, which since 2016 has been implementing the so-called superblocks model. This was developed to provide a solution to the high levels of air pollution, the lack of public green spaces in Barcelona. As set out in this slide, the superblocks are groups of streets covering nine blocks where traffic is reduced um, as far as possible to, to zero or close to zero. And with the space that's formerly that was formerly occupied by cars, given over to pedestrians and play areas. So this modifies road networks within 400 by 400 meter blocks to improve the, the availability of quality public space for community activities, for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, as of last year, six super blocks were in operation. Um, the report the reporting on it suggests that after some early pushback, the change has been broadly welcomed by residents and analysis are suggesting long-term benefits uh, in terms of uh, health, pollution levels and neighbourhood business development. In Paris, the importance of local uh, leadership and uh, a political champion has been quite important in their 15-minute model. Um, this so-called hyper-proximity and 15-minute city were a key pillar of the mayor's successful 2020 re-election campaign. The approach is designed to cut air pollution and to cut hours lost to commuting uh, and, and also to help the city achieve its plan to be carbon neutral by 2050. So Paris has already invested heavily in pedestrian and cycleways um, and it aims to turn the city into numerous 15-minute neighbourhoods. The mayor's committed to installing a cycle path on every street and bridge, enabled in part by turning 70% of car parking spaces um, to other uses. Uh, she's also about to increase office space, expand the use of infrastructure um, and buildings outside of standard hours, and to encourage people to use local shops, and to create small parks, for instance, in school playgrounds. Um, that would be open to local people outside of school hours to make up for the lack of public space in some neighbourhoods. Uh, so closer to home here uh, uh, in Scotland, there's an example of the Glasgow Avenues project. This is part of Glasgow's city region deal, um, which is funding that combines uh, investment from UK, national and city levels. Um, Glasgow's investing approximately 115 million pounds within the city to deliver on it. The basic aim is to introduce um, streetscape improvements throughout the city centre to form an integrated network of continuous pedestrian and cycle priority routes. City streets as part of this were assessed to establish where investment would create the greatest return, meaning socially and environmentally, as well as economically. Some pilot improvements are initially being undertaken on, on streets. Sucky Hall Street is, is one. These are acting as so, a sort of proof of concept for the overall plan. Uh, specific improvements include free Wi-Fi and intelligent street lighting, avenues of trees, segregated cycle lanes, and increased pedestrian and cycle space um, that's connected, so continuous footways and, and paths. Okay, you can see that there are different forms of this basic model being rolled out uh, in different countries in different contexts. It's important to think about the future prospects, particularly in the case of uh, COVID-19, as I think the pandemic raises several important points that highlight both the promise and potential challenges. As you can see in this slide, I've included another quote. It's from the Glasgow Herald newspaper from September last year. 
and it's a positive reaction from Scotland's Climate Emergency Response Group um, to Scotland's programme for government for 2020-21. The programme includes a commitment to take forward uh, the government's ambitions for 20-minute neighbourhoods. And this quote essentially uh, looks at lockdown and sees that this has underlined the merit of Scottish government's commitment to this idea. So I think there is an argument that the pandemic is providing momentum to the 20-minute concept. First, it's clearly increased focus on the well-being of communities and individuals, um, the priorities of resilience, sustainability, and livability are all being emphasised. There's also, of course, been a significant switch to remote working um, and the use of digital services to avoid commuting. People are spending more time in their neighbourhoods. The importance of an efficient, uncongested transport system has also been highlighted, not just in terms of limiting transmission of the virus, but also in increasing accessibility to care services. Of course, walking and cycling have emerged as more important forms of mobility for exercise, health and well-being. There's also been more use of smaller neighbourhood shops, a shift in the short term at least, from heavy dependence on centralised supermarkets and so on. There's been a rethinking of the nighttime economy as part of a decentralisation towards more neighbourhood focused uh, patterns and approaches. But I also think that the 20 minute neighbourhood, the 15 minute city and similar initiatives, I mean, they're no means without, uh, by no means without their critics. And I think looking forward, some tricky questions can be raised. First, the first one is, how does the 20 minute neighbourhood layer onto different urban forms and settings? There's a great deal of variation in terms of the scale, population density, urban shape and form, uh, development patterns, institutional frameworks. These vary across cities and spaces. Several large cities in the developing world are heavily congested uh, with uncontrolled development, weak regulatory frameworks, just to take this as a, an example. So replicating what's been done in Paris, in Barcelona, or in cities in the Netherlands may provide, uh, sorry, may prove to be very difficult in some places and would certainly require much more physical and cultural transformations. Also, I think if we look at the example of the city region as a functional space, it may not be ideally suited in terms of employment concentrations and movement times to this to this idea. In Glasgow city region, the city centre has been um, quite dominant in terms of employment numbers. So unless the changed patterns of commuting and working from home that COVID has prompted, unless this becomes entrenched, the city region based on 20 minute neighbourhoods may need uh, substantial job increases, for instance, in, in towns like Motherwell, where I, where I am just now in the outskirts of Glasgow, um, in order for this model to work. So should the concept apply for all functions, it may apply well to destinations for shopping or for recreation, but is access to jobs more of a, a regional issue for many people rather than a local issue? It's also important to think of this model and ask whether it's a solution to or a recipe for segregation, either social, demographic or other types. It's possible to envisage the concept working well in neighbourhoods where inhabitants have the type of jobs that may favour remote working. But other urban communities may find it more difficult to adapt. It may be that for affluent areas where, for example, uh, consumer demand can support small shops, that the fit with the 20 minute concept is more seamless than in more deprived areas. So in these circumstances, could inequalities, social inclusions, uh, social exclusions, could these be reproduced? Another issue relates to the change perception of the city. There's still the belief that a major asset and attraction of city life is the scope for a wide range um, of people and ideas to mix daily in flexible ways, thus producing creativity and innovation and so on. Does the 15 or 20 minute model limit this dynamism? Does it undermine the scale, intensity, the connectivity that drives cities? My final question is, is more practical or, or pragmatic. Transformations like these require capital investment. Um, with the impact of COVID, likely period of austerity and constraints on public investment budgets, 
Will further investments in these transformations uh, be possible, be feasible? And I've also talked about the important role given to policy governance involving active local leadership uh, and civic participation. But what do you do when, when local capacities, local cultures are not in place for this? So just to finish by drawing together some of the broad points from our presentation. First, I'd say the aims of the 20 minute neighbourhood and similar models fit well with key elements of current regional policy thinking. In the COVID era, it has clear attractions. If people are working more from home, then infrastructure and service provision must take this into account. However, I'd argue that there are difficulties in applying an equitable way. I also think there's a challenge in finding the capacity and different resources to support it and in ensuring uh, stakeholders are engaged. I've included a, a, a last slide with some of the sources I've looked at here. Um, but that's it. Thank you very much. As I've said, sorry, excuse me a moment. Um, as I've said, uh, this was just a, a review and issues highlighting issues for discussion. Um, and I think it would benefit from any views or, or insights from, from people taking part and I'd welcome any, any contributions. Uh, so thank you very much.